And it's going to change regardless of how many solar panels and electric cars and all the other good things we're doing. So both sides have it wrong. As you've heard me say, even at your audience in Vancouver years ago at your conference, you know, I pointed that out that this isn't a right or left issue. This is should be of interest to anybody doing financial planning beyond 10 or 20 years, thinking about their kids and grandkids, their estate planning, because the world's going to look different. And it doesn't care whether you're Republican or Democrat. OK, the ice is melting faster and faster. And if we look back in history, we can see where this is headed. Welcome to the Wigan Sessions. I'm Addison Wigan. I have with me today John Englander, who is a an oceanographer and has been studying uh, the rising sea level as a result of climate change. So there's a lot packed into that. And so we're going to have John help us unpack that um, because it's a political issue, of course, but also there's a lot of science involved. And uh, we don't want to fall into the trap of saying we don't believe in science. So uh, John's going to help us understand that. There's a couple of other things that are going on. Um, John leads uh, trips to Greenland, among other things, uh, to look at the glaciers and how they're actually melting. And uh, we're going to be going together in August, and we're going to actually walk on the glaciers and see like how that um, ecology is is unfolding. And then also there's some other interesting writers that are going to that are going to be on that trip. One works for the New York Times. Another one works for uh, uh, epic times. So we're, we're going to be engaged in a conversation about what the, um, what the melting of the, of the glaciers means. And uh, I want to introduce John because he's been studying the, the rise of sea level for, since I met him, that's 12 years, but way before that, and his, uh, his book is called Higher Ground. And that just means like, as, as the sea level rises, we're gonna need to understand the economics of what happens to cities that are close to the, to the, um, to the water. And John knows way more about this than I do. So, so let me welcome you, John, first. Thank you. Thanks, Addison. Great to be with you. And by the way, it's hard to read on that title of the book in the upper corner there, but it's moving to higher ground. So if somebody moving was to look for it, it's got to start with moving, even though higher ground is the, yeah. the, the, the destination in effect. Great yeah, to be you with know, you. We live in a place in Baltimore called Mount Washington. And like we and our neighbors think, oh, that would be great. Because <laughs> then we would have seaside. Uh, sure. But that's not really what's going on. And I know that you've uh, spent some time in Annapolis, which is not far from us. Yes. Like, trying to help them understand what rising sea level was going to do to to property values and those kinds of things. So why don't we get started just by having you describe what your project is, what the book says, and how you're trying to work with um, w municipalities, because that's your goal is to try to help people understand how the property values are going to change as it grows. And then I do want to get into the science of uh, the mel uh, melting glaciers and what can be done about it, because we've had many conversations about this, and it's not just about carbon emissions. Nope. So, but let's just start with like your project. Great. And by the way, mentioning Annapolis, you know, I, I live in Florida now, but um, which is another subject for sea level rise, which we'll yeah, get to. Right. But, but Annapolis was a great, and I'm glad you reminded me because I, I talked at your old college, actually, I think St. John's College, yep. um, if I recall, and um, for the city. But I also lectured on this at the U.S. Naval Academy because, of course, the, the Navy and the Coast Guard and the Armed Forces have a great interest in what's going to happen with sea level yeah, rise. Right so I gave a big lecture there at the in Annapolis at the Naval Academy. So the simple premise is this, is that amongst all the confusion and concern about uh, environment and ecologies and, and uh, things that are happening on the planet that are should be of concern, 
uh, to everybody. There's a physical issue that often gets overlooked, which is that the boundaries of the land ocean, what we call the shoreline or the coastline, okay, they move as sea level changes. And we hadn't seen that because for 6,000 years, it's been fairly stable. But indeed, sea level moves up and down about 400 feet by nature with the ice ages. And you recall that, we, we talked about that a few years ago. Um, it's a stunning fact to most people to say that there was a natural climate variation called the ice ages. Nobody doubts that. It happened about every 100,000 years for the last several million years. And as the ice sheets change size, the ice sheets and glaciers, sea level goes up and down 400 feet. That's, that's a mind blower because if sea level was 400 feet higher or lower, you can imagine the shoreline would be miles inland or, or out to sea. And we've been in this stable period for 6,000 years where sea level hasn't changed hardly at all. So we've taken it for granted as if sea level stable and the shoreline stable. And we get confused when there's a little erosion, but we need to be getting preparing for a different future. Sea level is gonna be five or 10 feet higher in the next century or so. And it probably won't stop there. We can get into that, that's another discussion. But the simple concept that even with natural sea level up and down movements by the ice ages, because as the size of Greenland above me, if, if your viewers or listeners can see this, and Antarctica behind me on this graphic, the, but everybody knows that this huge ice mass is it's in two places in the world, Greenland and Antarctica. That's 98% of the ice on land. And as that ice sheet changes size and glaciers, sea level changes. And as sea level changes, the shoreline moves. It's really profound. And we need to wake up to this new reality that after 6,000 years of stable sea level and stable shoreline, it's changing. And it's going to change regardless of how many solar panels and electric cars and all the other good things we're doing. So both sides have it wrong, as you've heard me say, even at your audience in Vancouver years ago at your conference, you know, I pointed that out that this isn't a right or left issue. This is should be of interest to anybody doing financial planning beyond 10 or 20 years, thinking about their kids and grandkids, their estate planning, because the world's going to look different. And it doesn't care whether you're Republican or Democrat, okay? The ice is melting faster and faster. And if we look back in history, we can see where this is headed. Can we talk about that a little bit? Because um, there's the science behind it, which I would like to hear about, but also um, the political response. like. Is it possible for us to mitigate the the rising sea level? Is that even a thing? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's perhaps the most important one of all. Um, here's the absolute simple facts. We can no longer stop sea level from rising uh, because the, we've put a lot of heat in the oceans. The oceans are already two, over two degrees Fahrenheit, over a degree Celsius warmer than they were a few hundred years ago. That extra heat means the ice sheets and glaciers are gonna get smaller. That, that, that's a simple correlation of just melting ice. And so if here's the problem. If we don't do anything to slow the greenhouse gases and the warming carbon dioxide layer that's trapping heat, this is gonna happen a lot faster. But even if we are perfect, even if we mandate that everybody should drive an electric car starting tomorrow and have solar panels and not burn any fossil fuels, even if we mandated that, the ice isn't going to stop melting tomorrow because there's a long lag time. It's kind of like stopping a super tanker, if you will, right? There's a lot of momentum, in this case, thermal momentum, okay? The heat that's in the ocean can't dis disappear quickly. So the truth is implausible to both sides. If we don't do anything, we're going to have an absolute catastrophe within our children or grandchildren's lifetime. So we need to do something. But we shouldn't be silly to think that if we just take all the right environmental steps, the climate change is gonna stop. That's why this position is actually disturbing to both, to both sides on the political spectrum. How much of it is just naturally occurring? I've got a slide I'll, I'll share with you for those, for your listeners, and uh, we did it in our last talk. Yeah. If you look back over 400,000 years, carbon dioxide and temperature go together. Interestingly, they go in this up and down swing about every 100,000 years. As global temperature changes, the ice sheets change and sea level rises. So carbon dioxide, temperature, and sea level all move together over long periods of time. But the response is an instant. And the problem is that the natural cycle, what we think of as the ice ages, which was not affected by humans, the natural cycle was driven by a change in the solar energy received because the elliptical orbit around the sun changes. 
about every 100,000 years. It's not That's not the magnetic pole shifting, by the way, as some think. But we know that the Ice Age cycles, according to something called the Milankovitch cycle, correlates with the amount of energy we receive because the elliptical orbit around the sun varies, okay? So that's the natural driver of climate change over millions of years. Normally, when it's in the warming phase, it releases carbon dioxide as the oceans warm. So when you warm the oceans, they release carbon dioxide and the level goes up. That's not what's happening now. We we actually are, should have been entering the cooling period when we've had an ice age 80,000 years from now, but that's not going to happen because we've warmed, we've changed things. Humans have changed things. And carbon dioxide has been demonstrated back in 1859 and it's not contested. It traps heat in the atmosphere. It's a clear gas. It's different than carbon and soot and, and uh, what we think of as pollutants in the air. It's a different kind of pollutant, it's invisible, but it does trap heat. And what it's doing now that it's gone from the normal range of 180 to 280, and it's now at 420, it's 50% higher than it's been in millions of years, it's trapping heat and warming the planet. So both are true. There was a natural climate change cycle that is in any sci earth science textbook that's been understood for centuries, the ice ages as we call them, but now we've broken out of the natural pattern because carbon dioxide is 50% higher than natural and it traps heat and it's warming the planet. So those two, that's why it's confusing because you have it from both ends, the natural cycle and now what humans are causing. And they both affect the temperature carbon dioxide relationship, but from one direction or the other. On the political spectrum, the argument is always about like what humans are doing to to cause it. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that? I know we've talked about it like over dinner. Yeah. But like, how do you think about that? Just so that we can get it, get sure. it on the same thing. It's like, it's not on a political level. People want to change policy. They want to make things happen that will slow it down, slow it down, whatever it is. Yeah. The, the warming. warming. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of resistance for people thinking that we're going to take their big trucks away from them or their SUVs or, or anything like that, or tell them to drive small cars and, or bicycle to work. I understand that, but let's set aside that policy prescription for a moment, make sure we understand the problem that by mankind's technology, which is wonderful and the current lifestyles and 8 billion people headed to 10 billion and people wanting better and better lifestyles and driving fantastic economies. The truth is that's changed the atmosphere and that's trapping heat. And that extra heat is melting the ice, the glaciers and that you're going to see next month in Greenland and Antarctica are as similar. As those melt, we're getting into a higher sea level such that we have not seen on earth or has not existed on earth for 122,000 years. That was the last natural sea level high, high, high water mark, and it was 25 feet above present. Now, most people don't even know that existed, but it's simple geologic history is as simple as the ice ages. We have to get a side around the politics. And again, I don't favor either side in this in terms of, uh, I think both sides tend to distort and use hyperbole. The truth is there's enough ice on Greenland and Antarctica if it all melts, sea level will be 212 feet higher and the shoreline will be tens of miles inland in most places. We can't let that happen because the planet won't be livable, frankly. So the question is, where do we balance having good energy and a free market? But how do you stop it? Yeah. And so you're, you're mentioning free market and I know we've talked about this before, but how does a free market approach uh, like a global crisis? Because right now we have this, I'm leading up to Larry Fink and his group and all that. Um, we, we have a lot of climate change initiatives going on with the group in, in Edinburgh and then Klaus Schwab, Larry Fink. They're raising a lot of money to try to change politics and the economics to address the problem. But if it's a scientific problem, how does that, how does that actually happen? Like it's a trend that's in place that I don't see how that works unless you're, I don't know, if it, we're talking about investing, you invest with them. Let's play it back to 50 years or so when we were, you know, kids in effect. Okay. There was a problem with rivers were catching on fire. The famous Cuyahoga River 
and uh, air pollution was so bad that buildings were deteriorating. And so when Nixon created the EPA and the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act back in the 70s to deal with those huge environmental problems, there were people who didn't want those government interventions either. But Richard Nixon, a strong conservative Republican, felt that that was the right thing to do. And in fact, we cleaned up a lot of those things because in effect, we put a price on pollution. And over the period of time between regulation and pollution, and economic incentives or penalties, we did clean up the rivers and you know in the United States at least significantly, and and everybody's quite pleased with that I think. So it's and that came out of the the on the conservative side, you know the Teddy Roosevelt side, if you will, right? The Teddy Roosevelt to Richard Nixon side, uh, and Ronald Reagan who felt that the environment was important in that context to have a you know healthy environment. Um, the problem is whether just like dumping industrial waste and pollution into rivers to the point where they catch on fire or caught on fire, okay? How do you introduce that to the free market? I believe there should be some, some pricing, whether people wanna call it taxes or not, or, or fees to associate the damage to the public good and give us economic incentives to shift policy. That's I mean, as broad as I can state it. I don't know any other way uh, because I, I do believe the strength of the market economy and you have to give lots of people an incentive to try and improve things for the world we're gonna leave our kids and grandkids. I do believe that. I'm not in favor of draconian legislation or, or regulation. Uh, and I'm very clear as you, as you know, to keep it away from being political like Republicans or Democrats have got this right. Both sides have messed up on this stuff. But if we care, it's pretty easy to see what's happening. You know, we're getting wildfires, we're getting deluge rains, we're getting droughts, um, we're getting strange storms, we're getting wildfires like never before. This is as was predicted on a warming planet. Now, I picked the issue of sea level rise because I got into this 50 years ago when I discovered an ancient shoreline 200 feet underwater. That was where the coast was 12,000 years ago. And uh, that was in the Bahamas and long in a story, but um, I've been fascinated by changing sea level my whole adult life. It was only about 20 years ago that I realized it was happening in real time. And, and the flooded streets from Miami to Annapolis, which again, you know, they keep track in Annapolis and that circle down before you go over to the Naval Academy. By Edgewater. Yeah, they, they keep records there because that's one of the oldest cities in America. And um, it used to be 50 years ago that that circle flooded four days a year. Now it's 40 days a year, okay? Because sea level's higher. Um, so, you know, and the Naval Academy's got big problems where classrooms have gone flooded and stuff like that. That didn't happen 100 years ago when those buildings were built. So we, we see the evidence all over the place and we may not want to change, um, but I try and make it clear to people to see without a political agenda, without any political um, bias, I believe, because um, as you know, I, I, I love talking to libertarians and conservatives be, and, and usually open their eyes to realize this is not a political agenda in my case, but we need to start preparing because it's gonna affect our investments and where we live and communities in a way we can hardly imagine. Imagine sea level 10 feet higher. I mean, it's gonna change the world. All right, so when you're having those conversations, what um, what is the, like, what is the response? Like there, there's this, there's this weird kind of thing, like it's not true. Like people, I think on the on the right, uh, there's a lot of people that just say, "Well, it's not happening." So, and I know that you've um, you've been face to face with that for a long time. So, what do you say to them? Well, the first thing I start is, "Do you believe in the ice ages?" And of course, they did. They've seen the kids' movies, Ice Age Part Two or Part One, Two, Three, and Four. <laughs> and I joke kids. about that. And a little bit of humor is helpful. Okay. And Ice Age Part Two, the meltdown depicted it very well. We had two miles of ice on North America, 10,000 feet of ice. And as it melted, sea level rose 400 feet. The movie got it right. It's based upon simple earth science. Okay. That's prior to most people's geologic understanding, but it's simple to go and find out. And can, you can do it with that funny cartoon movie. Um, when you make people aware that sea level has gone up and down 400 feet, in a repeating natural cycle, it gets their interest because it, that, that suggests that it's not caused by us. But then you, I can show where the natural cycle of the last 2.58 million years 
of natural sea level going up and down 400 feet, that now we're going up where we should be going down, that we've changed eras. And it correlates when changing the atmosphere. All of these numbers do add up. Even the people who've tried to disprove it, but done it with integrity, uh, like Richard Mueller out of Berkeley's uh, Earth Science, he tried yeah. to disprove this. And he came to the conclusion that, no, it's true. We are changing the climate and we're warming the planet. We're melting the ice. We're raising the ocean and we better start changing it. Or by our grandkids generation, there's going to be a world of hurt. All right. Describe a world of hurt because we're adaptable humans and we've been adaptable for millions of years, right? Yep. So the last, the last time sea level changed quickly was 12,000 years ago. Uh, and it rose about 15 feet in a century. And um, it, like the pandemic, you know, you can get fooled by the numbers today and extrapolate them and think they're going to stay linear, or you can plot a curve, or you can say this could get to exponential growth, which is what happened with the pandemic, of course. And we saw a two goes to four to eight to 16 to 32 and surprised the hell out of us in just a few months. Well, the same thing will happen with the melting glaciers and ice sheets that you're going to see in Greenland in August. Um, the rate of melting has tripled in 30 years. Now, it's still only a quarter of an inch a year, so who cares? The problem is you go from, if you double it, if you, hypothetically, if you go from a quarter of an inch a year to a half to one to two to four inches a year, just on the five fingers of your hand, we go from a quarter of an inch to five inches a year, okay? That's 50 inches a decade. That's, that's four feet of sea level rise in a decade. Okay, now I don't think it'll get quite that bad. But the point is just like the pandemic surprised us with the low numbers at first, exponential growth as happens in economics, as you've pointed out with high interest rates, you know, when, it, when inflation got above 11%, it changed the world, right? Because we could see that you can't sustain. It's happening in, again. Right. And so that's where, that's counterintuitive. You have to do the numbers to see where that extra, you know, that, that um, uh, exponential growth goes. But it's happened in geologic history. Now we've changed it this time. We should be in the cooling period, and eighty thousand years from now, we should be in the next ice age. Of course, that's too far in the future to worry about. But it doesn't matter because that's not going to happen. We've broken out of the cooling cycle that was natural, and we've added enough heat to this the system that the planet is measurably warmer. And when the planet's measurably warmer, the ice sheets get smaller. And when the ice sheets get smaller, the sea level rises. When you say, let's think about this practically, you, we look at the coastlines of the world, we look at the maps of the world as if they're static. Yeah. But the white, the two white things, the Greenland and Antarctica, okay, as they change volume, sea level changes and that changes the shorelines. This is so profound. It's going to put 30 nations underwater. Vietnam, just, just a foot or so of sea level rise will put most of Vietnam underwater. The Economist magazine has projected that this century, hundreds of millions of people will be displaced by rising waters. Because they will have to be. Right. They won't be able to live there anymore. That's right. When... We, we, we tend to confuse flooding from storms like a hurricane and coastal erosion and extreme high tides and sea level rise. They're really very different. Weather events are hard to predict, but are getting more extreme. Extreme high tides change by the position of the planets and are very predictable. Um, erosion is, is a natural thing and from Cape Cod to uh, the eastern, the Chesapeake to Florida, erosion happens all over the world. Sea level rise is different. It's a drip filling the bucket. So we tend not to see it. And again, in human history of 6,000 years, sea level doesn't change much. We, in fact, if you think about it, we measure land. Your house, I'm sure you know, is so many feet above sea level, probably on its property plat. You know, whether it's 100 feet above sea level, I think we talked about it. My house is 11 feet above sea level here in Florida. That hasn't changed. That's only changed like eight inches in a century. So we, we tend to think of it as pretty stable, but it's the acceleration. It's like that pandemic growth rate. Yeah. Do you think that the rise in sea level has increased the dramatic storms that we see and the, the fires and all that kind of stuff? Because I my own impression is that we just 
dramatize those things and they've always happened, but sea level hasn't affected them at all. Okay. See, but we're you you've turned you got it backwards with due respect. Okay. That we've warmed the atmosphere and that's put heat in the ocean. 93% of the heat stick is stored in the sea. And so you think of it like a giant outdoor swimming pool and you come out of summer when it's warm and then you know it stores its heat in the, in the pool and so it, it it stays warm even after a few days of cold weather outside so this giant ocean swimming pool has stored this excess heat an incredible amount of excess heat that's not going away anytime soon that extra heat does a few things it changes weather patterns both ocean and atmospheric circulation so the heat changes the the patterns of weather giving us more drought more high heat days as we're seeing in the headlines all over the world, more deluge rainfalls because the oceans evaporate more and come down as more rain or snow. That's all predicted with warming oceans. So as you warm the planet by trapping the heat in the atmosphere, it, it has these several effects of changing weather patterns, changing ocean currents, more droughts, more heat, more wildfires, um, et cetera. Um, sea level, is a very specific phenomenon that as we melt the ice on land, not the floating sea ice or icebergs, but the ice on Greenland and Antarctica, 98% of it is those two places, sea level is a function of melting the ice on land, raising the sea level for the first time significantly in 6,000 years. So when you're talking to groups of people, when you're trying to explain what you see happening, how do you like how do you convey to them that the sea level rise is a phenomenon whether we agree with it or not when they disagree with you like because i i've always i've asked you this question like yeah. 10 times <laughs> like if somebody challenges you on this and says they just don't agree with you how do you deal with that? You know, I mean, you're talking about science, right? Right. And I, I relate it to things they, that they can relate to. And you, again, we did it face to face at your last conference in Vancouver a decade ago. Um, and you've seen me do it elsewhere. And I do it with military leaders and engineering and intelligence agencies. And there's skeptics in every group. And I, I admire skeptics in science. That's good. Um, but when I relate it to the ice ages and how those two miles of ice that everybody knows came, covered North America, you know, and left things like Long Island and Cape right. Cod as relic, relics of the, of the retreating glaciers. We don't doubt that the ice ages happened. But when I explain it in real context and say the ice ages, um, uh, the glaciers created the Great Lakes 11,000 years ago, we tend to think they're permanent, okay? The earth's, the landforms are not permanent. They, right. They're just durable. And um, when you relate what we know of as the ice ages and nobody disputes the ice ages and explain that for two and a half million years, we've had ice ages about every hundred thousand years of the natural cycle, that makes sense to people. But now we're in a super warming era. We're already two degrees Fahrenheit, one degree Celsius round figures, warmer than we were before the industrial era. That extra heat is melting more ice. As the ice melts more, sea level is going to rise. Now, it could rise 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. It depends on how warm we get and how quickly we warm. So I try and to be non-political about or certainly nonpartisan about it and invite people to look at it through environmental lens, through an economic lens, through a national security lens, through a, you know architecture, engineering. There's lots of ways to get people's interest to their own house. But to be clear, not only do you talk about where you live, so I live in Florida. People ask me all the time, why would I live in Florida if I'm concerned about sea level? Well, I'm two miles inland. I'm 11 feet above sea level. Water's not gonna get to my house for 60, 80 years, okay? Even in the worst case. Um, Florida is not a flat state. People think it's all gonna go underwater. Even the New York Times mistakenly wrote something about that. Florida is about to go beneath the waves. Orlando's 80 feet above sea level. We need to get some reality into our earth science, okay? People have this super simplistic view of things because it's emotionally driven in most cases. They don't want Miami to go underwater. They don't want the Bahamas or the Florida Keys to go underwater. I don't want to get older, but I'm going to get older. 
you know, and we need to wake up to reality. And I talk to people like that. I, I, there's a natural part of this and there's part that we've affected. And if we care about our legacy, our investments, our kids, and the legacy for future generations, we need to be honest. Well, let's talk about the investments. And this is a part of the reason I wanted to talk to you is that there are uh, initiatives underway. Um, one of them is ESG, which is the acronym for environmental, social, and governance that is being propelled in the corporate environment to try to address climate change and um, social issues like uh, racism and that kind of thing. And then governance, like not wanting, you know, like we don't invest in companies that are defrauding their customers, right? Yeah, I, I would never say I was an expert in ESG, but I, but I have presented to companies who- Well, it comes your way though, because yeah. of environmental- No, I, I, in fact, um, it's more of an issue in Europe and Asia, I find. And uh, some investment houses in Hong Kong and London had me give presentations to their analysts about sea level rise as an ESG issue. So I, that's how I got exposed to it. ESG, for, for your viewers who aren't familiar, um, as you say, is environment, social, and governance. And even the SEC has written about it. In the last 20 years, just doing some quick research, it went from being mentioned in 1% of the earnings calls to 20% last year. So there's been a huge growth in 20 years. Since 2003, it started. It was the first use of the term. But interestingly, BlackRock and Larry Fink, the, premise, the, the president, who's one of the biggest investment firms in the world, of course, um, it's interesting, he was one of the big proponents and he was recently quoted as saying, maybe um, it's, it's been overplayed at the moment because of course the compl complication of the war in Russia or in U Ukraine, I should say, and the issues about Russian energy, which are causing companies and countries to look at fossil fuels with a fresh eye because of the, you know, the problem of supplying the world with enough energy. Um, even Larry Fink with BlackRock has said, maybe we overstepped it a little bit. In fact, there's a headline last week on, on July 5th, uh, 2022, in the Financial Times of London, you know, very reputed paper, said how ESG investing came to a reckoning with allegations of greenwashing at the highest levels does it still make sense for funds to package together environmental, social, and governance factors? Finally, the term ESG is less than two decades old, but it may already be coming to an end of its useful life. Okay, so very appropriate and timely quote to your question. Um, it's been kind of the, the, the new thing beyond what's on the balance sheet and the income statement of a company what are the environmental, social, or governance issues that could affect its value? And ESG had a, a two-sided uh, two aspects, I guess. One is how can we use ESG to do some good in the world, but also how will those issues affect the company's values, uh, whether it's a coffee company like Starbucks and what the concerns about what's happening to the uh, you know, to, to growing uh, the coffee bean, for example, is one example of how environment could affect the value of a company. If the price for Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks goes, you know, too high to the customer, it could, it could impact its value. But it was proactively being used as a way to, to create funds that embraced good governance, good social values, representation of women and minorities, and so on, and good environmental policies as a way to, to pursue change. But again, not this isn't John Englander talking, according to the Financial Times, maybe it was overplayed a little bit. What does that mean it was overplayed though? Like the These articles, in fact, based upon your question that. the other day, I did some research and, and there, there seems, there was this tremendous growth in ESG funds uh, up to uh, Morningstar set up to, um, I had the figure here, at X trillions of dollars was being managed. It was grew by, yeah, to $2.7 trillion is the level of ESG funds, according to Morningstar, okay? Huge amount of money being put into funds that would invest with that consideration. 
to try and affect change. Okay. Well, Larry Fink himself manages eleven trillion dollars. Right, and so I, I get, I guess I'm not an expert in this, but obviously not all of his funds or not all of BlackRock's funds were following ESG, yeah. but but those were the funds and portfolios and ETFs that specifically said they were taking ESG considerations into their valuation, you know, where they're, they're buying of the company. So again, that's beyond my level, but that's yeah, where ESG you know, is I, I get when you say that it's beyond your level, because I feel like it's beyond my level too. But when, when I'm doing the work that I do and I look at um, like the policies that are put in place in China, where they just kind of ignore all these things like ESG only applies to the Western world, really, and mostly in Europe. Yeah, as I say, my two actually my two presentations were in London. One for one was a, a British firm. One was for a Chinese Hong Kong firm whose office was there. Uh, so they, they seem to be much more sensitive to ESG. This was before the pandemic, so three or four years ago. I don't know. It's it's just weird that it's uh to, for me anyway that it's like a theme that is recurring right now. Like we're coming out of the pandemic and suddenly everyone's talking about ESG. <laughs> well, like, again, they must have heard you because the FT, um, you know, said maybe maybe it's peaked. <laughs> yeah, well, it could be lots to talk about. So, John, we're going to be going to to Greenland. Tell us about that. Greenland. Um, it, it tends to be an overlooked place for most people. Uh, only 56,000 people live there. It's the biggest island on the planet. It's nearly the size of Australia, which is a continent. And um, it's covered by two miles of ice. And the history of it is fascinating. Uh, we're going to talk about that somewhat. But it's been well documented there for centuries. And um, even with historical records, even longer, how the ice sheets changed. And it's a place of great scientific discovery, drilling down into the ice sheet and deciphering the ice cores layer by layer, year by year, just as you would look at tree rings, you know, in a, into a tree and see what happened year by year, whether it was fire or drought or, you know, uh, different conditions as a tree grew. Well, as the ice sheet gets, gets laid down, uh, snowfall by snowfall, we can decipher that. And uh, we're gonna see some of those ice cores actually in the ice core lab in uh, Copenhagen before we go over to Greenland. But then watching and, and, and putting in scale what happens with the Greenland glacier um, and ice sheet, glaciers and ice sheet, um, really puts us in a different perspective. It's like the first time you were in a boat and went out of sight of land. Uh, yeah. We're gonna be doing that, but it's gonna be ice all the way around us from a, even from a helicopter height. Um, but it puts it all in context and Again, the ice on Greenland by itself, if we allow it all to melt, which hasn't happened for millions of years, but if, if we warm the world enough that it melts quicker and quicker, sea level would be 25 feet higher globally. Antarctica is seven times that volume, 186 feet. Um, so the two of them together, 212 feet of, of potential sea level rise. We need to be... Um, sensitive and observant about what's happening in Greenland and Antarctica, because when we put them in the ice age cycles of the last two and a half million years, which were natural, and we see that something's changed now because we're warming and we should be cooling according to the natural cycle, and all the numbers add up, forget the politics um, and the agendas. The truth is we can't stop sea level rise quickly, as we said earlier. And we are gonna see evidence of that in Greenland in a way that's just unmistakable. And I find having taken senators and military leaders and uh, from, I mean, the Navy and the Air Force and the Coast Guard uh, to Greenland and putting the pieces together there on site has a really um, penetrating impact because uh, there are no distractions. Our cell phones are off, you know, we, um, and it's just a way to contemplate the world from a very different perspective. And uh, it's very, very powerful. I think, it, it, as you cited in my book, my new book, uh, Moving to Higher Ground, uh, Senator Angus King wrote the introduction and he talked about that uh, how, because he was one of the people I took to Greenland or he took me to Greenland, I guess, with the Commandant of the Coast Guard a few years ago and uh, had a profound impact on him. 
and uh, so uh, I, I think I think you'll I, I know you'll find it uh, enlightening and uh, everybody takes away something slightly different but it's uh, I find it I've been there about nine or ten times I find it um, compelling right now I owe you my uh, measurements for <laughs> for my parka yes you do <laughs> I need that so I'll I'll get those to you Thank all right you. John We'll catch up and uh, we'll do a couple more of these interviews. And I know you're bringing more interesting people on that trip. So it'll be good. And well, actually, one thing that you might want to still include in this, uh, for those that, that are confused by the graphics I was describing, I do have a small slide set and I can give you a simple email address if anybody wants to get the graphics. Yeah, send it but, to me. I'll, I'll publish it. it yeah. Okay. I mean, it's slides at johnenglander.net. I'll put it in an email, but you, you, in the last time you interviewed me, I gave you some graphics, which you cut in yeah. and um, yeah. you, you can use those again. Do that again. And plus I'm going to, I'm going to bring my camera with, when we go. Great. So we'll get some good stuff. <laughs> Great. You need to fill out that little questionnaire too. It's, it's just like 10 questions. It's really simple. It's just like where to ship the, the parka and what flight you're arriving and all that. Just, okay. It was last week. <laughs> You yeah. can tell I'm a detailed person. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. why you have good staff. <laughs>